everyone, welcome to our virtual classroom. Today we're going to be talking about the five phases of oppression by Iris Marion Young. In her article, she asks a fundamental question, and that question is, what is oppression? Um, traditionally, oppression means the exercise of tyranny by a ruling group. Yet, um, what Young wants to point out is that oppression creates injustice in other circumstances as well. So, it's, in a well-intentioned liberal society, um, could place system-wide constraints on groups and limit their freedom. Um, democracies can be just as oppressive as tyrannies. Oppression uh, for young can be the result of either a few, pieces, few people's choices, so a king or a tyrant, or policies that cause embedded unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols. Um, for instance, under American democracy or the British parliamentary system. These societal rules can become a restrictive structure of forces and barriers uh, that immobilize and reduce a group of, or category of people. Um, for young, what's really important to understand is that oppression is structural. It's not one person over another. It has these sort of norms, these habits, these symbols, these different ideas that make oppression what it is. Um, for her, the way she's defining oppression is that when people reduce the potential for other people to be fully human, that's her definition. Um, this could mean treating them in a dehumanizing manner, but it could also mean denying people language, education, and other opportunities that might make them become fully human in both mind and body. Uh, people should feel free to pursue their life plans in their own way. And the thing that she wants to talk about is that oppressive forces seek to diminish those plants and thus those people as well. Um, so oppression for young isn't necessarily really explicit forms of oppression. It, she sees it um, operating in different types of ways. Young argues that it's not possible to give one essential definition of oppression. This is because different factors or combinations of factors constitute oppression of different groups. Um, this is a quote from her on page 42. For every oppressed group, there is a group that is privileged in relation to that group. So this is why her article is called The Five Faces of Oppression. She doesn't think that we can just find one way that individuals are, are oppressed. Instead, uh, she's going to give us five ways that sort of interlock, inter, interlock and overlap, um, and, and we'll see what she's talking about uh, as we continue on. One of the things that uh, is important to understanding Young's theory is the concept of a social group. Uh, for her, a social group is a collective of persons differentiated from at least one other group by cultural forms, practices, or ways of life. Traditional political philosophy often misunderstands the concept of a social group. So sometimes uh, when people think about political philosophy, they might group people together by attribute. Um, some group individuals by particular attributes, maybe uh, skin color, genitals, whether you're male or female, how old you are, um, but these classifications are arbitrary. Um, so it is a mistake to identify individuals by them. Um, Young argues instead that what defines a social group is not a particular attribute, but a shared sense of identity. So how are people, it's not a matter of the actual color of your skin, or if you're a male or a female, or maybe if you identify, if you're homosexual or not, um, it's how you identify. Do you identify as a person of color? Do you identify as a man? Do you identify as a female? These are the things that she's talking about. Um, another model um, of understanding groups is grouping by association. This model treats groups as a kind of formalized, organized institution, like a club, corporation, or political party. Um, and in both of these models, um, they fail to properly explain how social groups really work because they focus too much on individuality. Um, so remember back to Hobbes and Mill. Um, they are really, really uh, interested in the individuality and they start with the idea of individuals and then those individuals form into groups. But what Jung wants to say is that they have it backwards. Um, he actually, she actually thinks that group identity forms individual identity. You can't have an identity as an individual 
unless you are already sort of part of a group. For young, uh, groups only exist in relation to other groups. Groups can come to exist only because an outsider labels them such. Um, I have this little link here to the stuff white people like .com. We uh, looked at that in class, so that's an example uh, last week. Um, but that's an example of how some people, um, you know, the way that we sort of identify groups in relationship to other groups. Um, group differences, according to Young, cut across one another. Um, in other words, they can be a member of multiple groups. Uh, one person can be a member of multiple groups simultaneously. Uh, group differentiation on Young's view is multiple cross-cutting, fluid, and shifting. So whether or not you're in a member of a group um, is not sort of a set uh, model. It's not like if you um, are born with white skin, you're automatically in a particular group. It's because um, the way that we sort of self-identify is, is very sort of complicated. Okay, so now we're getting down to the actual five faces of oppression that Jung talks about. Again, a person can be oppressed in one of these ways, in all five of these ways, and sometimes the way that these different um, vectors of oppression work, they cross-cut cross, cross cut each other. So the first one that Young wants to talk about is exploitation. Um, she defines this as the act of using people's labors to produce profit while not compensating them fairly. Um, so an example of this are people who work in sweatshops who aren't paid fairly for their efforts. Um, another example could be people in Amazon fulfillment centers. Now, you might say, oh, well, people in Amazon fulfillment centers get paid, you know, a decent wage, but they're, it, it, they're required to sort of, you know, work themselves to the bone. Um, and they don't get breaks. You can't, you know, use the restroom when you want to. Um, and so they're sort of not compensating people fairly for the amount of work that they're doing. This is a Marxist critique. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with uh, Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto. He's the founder of communism. Um, but this is a certain form of critique. Um, and it's a Marxist critique. And that's all you really need to know about Marx. Um, Here's some more about exploitation for young. Exploitation uses capitalism specifically to oppress. This is where the Marxist critique comes in because Marx critiques capitalism explicitly. Capitalism states that people are free to exchange goods freely. Yet, whenever this has happened throughout society, it has created different classes of people, the, the haves and the haves nots, the wealthy and the poor. Karl Marx, the father of communism, said that capitalism creates haves uh, and have-nots. Typically, in a capitalist society, the haves end up exploiting the have-nots for their hard work. So, for instance, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, owns, has billions and billions of dollars, yet he continues to put in these policies at these Amazon fulfillment centers that really exploit the labor of the workers. Therefore, exploitation creates a system that perpetuates class differences, keeping the rich rich and the poor poor. Um, if you're a person who's just working and paycheck to paycheck, it's hard to get ahead because you can't save up any money. Whereas the people at the top, the Jeff Bezos of the world, sort of squeeze you, squeeze their workers, squeeze every ounce of money out of them. And that's how they end up sort of getting this huge masses of money. And, and this is what Young is talking about when she talks about exploitation. The second face of oppression is marginalization. Marginalization is the act of relegating or combining a group of people to a lower social standing or outer limit or edge of society. It's a process of exclusion. Um, this happens when society has decided that it cannot or will not use people even for labor. Um, so here's an example. Um, sometimes people are marginalized based on race. Um, the Aboriginal communities of Australia uh, were excluded from society and pushed farther and farther away from their homelands as cities grew. Um, the marginalization of Aborigines happened when society met the needs of white people and not the needs of the marginalized themselves. Um, so we can think of this um, with a reference to Native Americans not being employed or people with certain disabilities 
um, not being able to get jobs uh, the same way that everybody else can. And that would be an example of marginalization. Um, here's some more examples of marginalized groups in the United States. Um, elderly people who are fired for their jobs, so ageism uh, operating. Uh, young blacks or Latinos who can't find their first or second jobs. Many single mothers and their children. Uh, people don't want to hire single mothers because they think, oh, well, they'll never come to work. Um, many mentally and physically disabled people and American Native Indians, especially those on reservations. Marginaliz marginalization uh, expels a whole category of people from useful participation in social life. As a result, these groups are subjected to severe mental deprivation. Um, in that they don't have access to basic resources and even extermination in some extreme cases, um, such as genocide. So if you're a group of people, I mean, the classic thought of this is the, um, the, the Jews in Nazi Germany. Um, so if you're Jewish, you would be subject to sort of, you know, pushed aside. And then obviously the um, awful genocide of the Holocaust. <clears throat> The third face of oppression that Young talks about is powerlessness. Um, in this case, some people have power while others have no power. The powerless are dominated by the ruling class and are situated to take orders and rarely have the right to give them. Some of the fundamental injustices associated with powerlessness include um, inhibition develop to develop one's capacities, lack of decision-making power, and exposure to disrespectful treatment because of lowered status. Powerlessness is a strong form of oppression because it allows people to oppress themselves. So here's an example from Harriet Tubman um, about, um, about slaves in America. Uh, she once wrote, I would have freed thousands more if they had known they were slaves. So in these words, Tubman conveys that some slaves felt so powerless and were so indoctrinated by the mindsets of their slave masters that they didn't realize that they themselves were slaves. Um, so there's this idea that powerlessness, if you're in a situation where you don't have the same amount of power to sort of go about your lives and do what you want to do, um, sometimes that can become an internalized idea where you no longer think you have the ability to do anything. Um, so this is, can be a really insidious, a really dangerous uh, form of oppression because it's something that can happen, that we can do to ourselves um, because of what's going on externally. Um, fourth one is called cultural imperialism. Um, it involves taking the culture of the ruling class and establishing it as the norm. The groups that have power in society to control how the people in that society interpret and communicate Therefore, the beliefs of that society are the most widely disseminated and express the experience, values, goals, and achievements of these groups. So we can see, um, you know, I have this link here. I'm not going to click on it because it's going to mess up my recording. Um, you can play with it later. But this is um, a link that takes you to a map of um, the United States and Canada, um, and it shows you what it would look like before uh, we were colonized by the British. Um, and it shows you different overlapping, um, uh, you know, the way that the, the tribes or the, the, yeah, the Native American um, groups of people would interact with one another um, and the way that their tribes sort of overlapped. So they didn't have strict sort of boundaries um, on like states or anything like that, but all of their sort of territories would overlap. Um, so this idea that, um, you know, Christopher Columbus is going to come over to the United States, he's going to put, you know, we're going to draw, you know, we're going to colonize, we're going to draw lines, um, is, is a form of cultural imperialism. Um, here's another example, uh, heterosexuality. So uh, in America, the dominant group of, in society is heterosexual. So all other types of sexuality are grouped as other and viewed as inferior or abnormal. Culture and education systems reinforce the notion that heterosexuality is normal and better, um, and those who have different types of sexuality are told to become heterosexual. So the, the ruling group, um, heterosexuals say, okay, everything else, abnormal. Um, this is another version of cultural imperialism. Um, here's another example, modern India. Um, India was colonized by the British Empire. 
um, their language and some of their belief system was taken over by the language and belief system of the British. So a lot of modern Indians speak English um, and have many mannerisms of British generation after their enslavement by Britain has ended. So there's a sense, you know, even though India is no longer um, uh, colonized by the British, they still drink tea, they speak English, um, they speak British English. Um, and um, that's a sort of modern uh, example of, of cultural imperialism. Um, those who are oppressed by cultural imperialism are marked, both marked by stereotypes and made to feel invisible. So this is something that's kind of interesting about cultural imperialism. So they're marked by stereotypes and made to feel invisible. So it's a sort of double bind. Um, the stereotypes define what they can and cannot be. At the same time, these stereotypes turn these people into a mass of others that lack separate identities. Um, the white male under this idea can have a distinct identity and be an individual because he holds all the power uh, or the most power. All other groups are just groups of others. Um, so there's a sense in which, okay, so you're stereotyped, um, you, know, you know, there's a million stereotypes out there. Um, so you're, you're sort of just sort of marked by what your stereotype is, but you're made to feel invisible because you're only seen as the stereotype. That's what Young is getting at here. You're not really seen for who you are. You're only seen as a, you know, white woman, a black man, a, um, an Asian, uh, Asian man. Uh, so the, you're only seen as that. You're not seen as an actual person. So that's why you're both stereotyped and invisible. The last phase of oppression is sort of the most um, obvious, uh, violence. Um, members of some groups live with the knowledge that they must fear random, unprovoked attacks on their persons or property. Uh, these attacks do not necessarily need a motive, but are intended to damage, humiliate, or destroy the person. So tons of examples of this we can think of. Um, a lot of hate crimes are directed against the gay community, uh, the trans community. Um, if we just want to think about lynchings um, and things that were going on during the Jim Crow era and, era and beyond, these are all sort of obvious examples of violence.